Good evening, and welcome to yet another one of our weekly uh, online interactive adult Bible study series here. I am Pastor Steve Wagner, Senior Pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Lombard, Illinois. And once again, we are about to go at it um, with another live stream version of our of our adult Bible study series. Now this one is kind of special in a sense because this one is for the last Sunday of the church year. The last Sunday of the church year, which is this coming Sunday. So um, the Sunday following will be the new church year. And of course the first season in the church year, excuse me, is Advent. So the season of Advent starts two weeks or uh, two Sundays from now, uh, as we're watching today on uh, Wednesday, November 18th. So um, we are studying the last Sunday of the church year today. And one announcement before we get started about next Wednesday. Uh, we are going to have a bit of a juggled schedule because here at Trinity in Lombard, um, it is our tradition that we will be continuing this year to have Thanksgiving uh, worship services. Uh, we have a worship service Thanksgiving Eve, uh, Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., and one Thanksgiving morning, Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So um, next Wednesday, as we will be prepping for our worship service next Wednesday, there will be no streamed adult Bible study next week. However, at 7 p.m. Central instead of 6, uh, the usual Bible study time, 6 p.m. No Bible study next Wednesday, but next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central time, you can watch the live streaming of our Thanksgiving Eve worship service. Um, the Reverend Dr. James Kellerman from First Bethlehem Lutheran in the city of Chicago will be leading uh, our liturgy, and I will be preaching. So join us for that next week. So note that change next Wednesday only. No adult Bible study next Wednesday at 6 p.m. However, there will be a worship service next Wednesday at 7 p.m. All right. So, we're going to get at it as we are wont to do. And like we said, we're talking about the last day of the of the last Sunday of the church year. Now, typically on the last Sunday of the church year, it talks about uh, the end times. And honestly, for the better part of November leading up to it, the previous two or three Sundays before the last one also has a lot of end time and judgment type of stuff uh, in the text. And we've been seeing that a lot lately. And so this is going to be no, uh, no exception. But the thing that you have to keep in mind is that while when you look at these last day final judgment uh, text that we look at this time of year, um, there's a lot of doom, gloom, destruction, death, and, you know, pain, blues, and agony. But remember that that is for the punishment of sin, of which you, a child of God, are not part of. Your sins have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And so anytime you study the end times, it's very helpful to keep that straight. All right, so let's do what we always do, look at our theme, and then unpack it. So our theme today, at the end times, God separates the righteous from the wicked. At the end times, God separates the righteous from the wicked. Now you might say, well, duh. Um, and I hope that's what you say, because it's a very basic tenet of Christianity, but it's the most important tenet of Christianity. So um, this is something we're going to unpack. It's something that is, you know, foundational to the faith, but it's also because it's so important and because it's uh, for the last Sunday of the church year, we're going to unpack it just a little bit. So our text tonight, our Old Testament lesson for this coming Sunday, the last Sunday of the church year, comes to us from Ezekiel 34. Uh, we will put our gospel lesson up on this side when we get to it, Matthew 25. And it sure looks like um, our Sam Grunwald instituted 
uh, graphics software program thing that is making all of this work is working at the moment. Uh, Sam is actually not in this room. Sam showed up here a little earlier this afternoon to once again go over everything and make sure everything was set up. So uh, we didn't have the chaos we had at three minutes till Bible study last week. Uh, but Sam was here to make sure it got set up. He even took the time to start a little step-by-step -step thing so that, you know, live streaming for dummies kind of a thing. So um, he's done an awful lot of good things for us to help us out with this. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to look at Ezekiel 34 in two sections. First will be uh, verses 11 through 16, and then um, verses 20 through 24. There's two parts to it. So first we're going to look at Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16. So we will go ahead and put that up on the screen for you. <clears throat> Therefore thus says the Lord God to them, Behold I, I myself... You know what? That is not correct. See, I have already messed up. I, I knew I should have gotten Sam here. I did it wrong. I am going to need about 45 seconds to rectify this. I My apologies. This is what I get for going without Sam. So I'm going to put you on a brief pause, and I will be right back. And please feel free to mock me while I'm gone. Okay, I think we're back, guys. I don't know what you saw, but if uh, you might have saw me doing a few click click -aroos, but we are back. So we're going to start with Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16. So we'll put, yeah, I got it right this time. All right, here we go. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will scatter them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that they have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. <clears throat> there they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. All right. A little scooch over here, perhaps. All righty. I think I did that the wrong. That's a little bit more better. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Still learning. But we recovered. Jeff, 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 if I'm your hero, sir, you need to aim higher. That does not get a bell. You need to shoot higher than me, but thank you for the kind words. All right. Um, context, because I know Jeff Steppen is going to ask for it. What you just heard <clears throat> was God talking about rescuing a group of people. Now, at this particular time at Ezekiel's ministry, what had been going on was... Um, the leaders of God's flock, uh, the Old Testament pastors of the church, so to speak, were not very good at being pastors. 
um, when one is put in charge of a congregation, uh, one, at least of a Christian congregation anyways, and not some sort of a cult or something, um, the job of the pastor is to point people to Jesus and to make sure that the people are fed by the word of Jesus. And uh, here in the New Testament era, uh, sacraments administered according to um, uh, the command of Jesus and the creation of Jesus. But in this days, that's not what was happening. You had uh, a lot of corruption. You had uh, uh, church leaders, temple leader, group leaders that were uh, negligent, that were very self-serving. So the people were not getting fed with the Word of God as they ought to be. <clears throat> so as a result, well, think about what would happen if um, week after week after week, instead of me coming out here teaching the Word of God and pointing you to Jesus, what would happen if I came out here and just espoused my personal points of view on whatever? what I thought religion ought to be like, what I, you know, if you've got my opinion on political commentary or sports analysis or whatever, um, you would not be hearing the Word of God if that were going on. And we've talked a whole bunch about how it's God's Word that keeps your faith nourished, strong, and fed. So if you conversely take that away, well, that means that your faith is going to get weak and weak and weak, and you could get into real spiritual distress. <clears throat> and so that's what we're talking about here that's been going on. These people have been uh, neglected in terms of good spiritual care, and so it's starting to show. So as a result of this, God steps up to the plate, and he says... I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. <clears throat> so God is saying that he personally will shepherd his people after removing uh, the negligent, self-serving, corrupt prophets in a form of judgment. All right, now a couple of things here. Okay, the idea of uh, sheep. It's all over Scripture where God's people are compared to sheep. And it's a pretty apt comparison because, quite frankly, uh, it's not a very flattering comparison. It's certainly not a compliment, but it is accurate. Uh, sheep, oh, how can I say it in a nice way? They're not smart animals. <laughs> they... Um, they wander off easily. They can't think for themselves. They need constant care. They're unable to care for themselves. Uh, without a shepherd, they are literally wandering through life lost. And the harsh reality is when you compare certainly us to God, um, we're about as helpless and as intelligent as a sheep. So it's a good comparison. And at the same time, without the uh, guidance of a shepherd constantly telling us what to do, constantly helping us, constantly caring for us, we would wander off and get into some really uh, dark places as well. So, us being compared to a sheep is pretty good. Now, God is saying, okay, these guys weren't doing the job, so I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to step up and I'm going to do it myself. Now, that tells you a couple of things. One, it shows that God cares about spiritual care. He knows how important that spiritual care is to his people, and he certainly cares about it. Tavany, sounds like humans. You got it, right? I mean, that's us, isn't it? So God cares. He knows you need good spiritual health, and he's going to make sure that you get it. The second thing is, you know, how about that, <clears throat> that idea that you tend to hear on time, all the time? Well, the Old Testament's all law, and the gospel is in the uh, New Testament. Uh, the God of the New Testament, Jesus, you know, that's the gospel and everything, but the Old Testament God, that's the God of judgment and harsh and 
all of that stuff. Well, can you not, is there, is there any greater expression of gospel anywhere in the Old or New Testament than God shoving aside inept, corrupt spiritual leaders and taking over the reins to care for his people himself? This is as much, this is as big of a gospel oriented God as you're going to see anywhere in Scripture. And yes, it's in the Old Testament. So this is Old Testament gospel. God is going to take over, and God's going to make sure that his people are fed. Now he says that <clears throat> as a shepherd seeks out his flock, he is going to seek his sheep. All right. So, in our analogy, shepherd sheep, the shepherd proactively looks for endangered sheep. He has to, because if sheep wander off, if sheep get into some kind of danger, they are completely incapable of rescuing themselves. He's got to go do it. And so, uh, that's what a shepherd does, and so that's what the shepherd of God's people is going to do, proactively go after um, his people. Now, this is one of those um, kind of pro-Lutheran type of, of uh, arguments. When you look at the idea in a large part of American Christianity today that you were saved by you making the choice to give your life to Jesus. Well, a sheep is not capable of making any type of coherent, positive decisions. And that's how God compares us to a sheep. The shepherd's got to go get the sheep and drag it back. That is how we're saved. God going to get us. Not us searching for God, but God coming to get us because he loves us. So that's exactly what he's going to do here. He says that he will... Bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries. Bring them out. All right. So God is going to seek to actively rescue his lost sheep. And then it says he's going to bring them into his own land in verse 13. I will bring them into their own land. Okay. Now, this is long after... The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy days when uh, those passages and the narrative was dominated by the promised land, the physical piece of land where God's people would set up shop. So we're not talking about a piece of earthly land. And honestly, the Hebrew verbiage that is used in this phrase implies a gathering of his people in a communion as opposed to an earthly promised land. The communion of believers. <clears throat> Raise your hand out there in internet TV land if you at one time went over Luther small catechism to join the Lutheran church. I know for a fact Taffany did because I taught it to her myself. Um, most of you did. If you have, you might recall the teachings of the third article of the Apostles' Creed, the visible versus the invisible church. Uh, the church, according to Luther, and in Lutheran doctrine and teaching, the church is not the building that the people gather in. The church is not the institution itself uh, that permeates worship. But the church is the people. What's that little thing? The church is the people with the steeple thing. I know people. I, I've seen it being done, but um, the church is the people, and so 
according to Luther, the invisible church is the collection of all believers of all times invisibly connected by their faith in Jesus, the communion of saints. So this um, verbiage that we're talking about here, yes, Lori, we are the church. Um, <clears throat> this verbiage that we're talking about here talks about the communion of saints uh, when he says that he's going to gather them in their own land, talking about a communion of saints rather than another earthly promised land. All right, then he says, uh, also verse 13, I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and so forth. I will feed them. Now understand that to mean <clears throat> God is not only going to rescue them and save them, but could you imagine a God that rescued somebody, pulled them out of peril, rescued them, and now sent them on their way into, on, into other peril? Good luck! Hope you make it! That's not how God works. God is not only in the business of saving, but God provides for His children. God provides for His children even today. So, there, going back to more catechism, the first article of the Creed, uh, in Luther's small catechism, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of Heaven and Earth, simple statement. Uh, when you confess that, according to Luther, you're confessing four things. A, God made everything, that's great. B, God saved us, He provides for us, and He takes care of us. So He didn't just make us, He also cares for us. And three... He protects us from all evil. Um, did you get in a car today and drive anywhere? If you did, because you are on this stream, I'm going to assume that you, not, you did not die in a fiery car crash. Well, understand something. Understand clearly that the devil tried to get you into a fiery car crash. The devil tried to bring about any sort of calamity he could possibly bring upon you. He tried, but he failed, and the only reason he failed, the only reason you made it to wherever you were going safely is simply because God protected you. So God made you, God cares for you, provides for you, God protects you, and for he does it not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. So here you see... Isn't Luther so practical and relevant? Here you see God is not only going to save his people, he's going to take care of them too. And God takes care of you. He says that they're going to lie down in good grazing land. So this is a picture of people being cared for as opposed to their current reality which they're in spiritual bondage. You know, anytime you start talking about bondage, the Old Testament imagery of Egypt keeps conjuring up and the, the physical slavery that they were in, which foreshadows um, or points to the spiritual bondage and slavery that original sin puts us in. And um, again, if you don't have a strong faith, you're going down a road of... Um, spiritual bondage and decay, and that's the way these people were going um, because the people God had set in charge of them were not doing their job. <clears throat> and then God says, I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. That's verse 15. I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. I myself will be the shepherd. I myself will be the shepherd. Okay. <clears throat> so God is emphasizing, A, he's emphasizing again, I'm going to take over this job and I'm going to make sure it's going to be done right because it's really important and I love you. Now, Understand that in a healthy church setting, this is how it's supposed to work. 
in a healthy church setting, let me draw a little thing here. All right, now I don't know if I don't know how well this is going to play on uh, TV. You know what? I might try a little gadget thing though. Watch this. Oh, uh, that's as close as I can zoom in, I guess. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to show. But what I did is I have God and I have his people. And there's a line, God providing for his people. And I wrote the line through the pastor. God feeds the people through the pastor. God isn't necessarily physically here um, for the... Uh, benefit of for the purpose of doing uh the the caring for and the feeding of his people but the fact is that he doesn't have to be because that's the job of the pastor uh pastor is called to make sure the people are fed so god feeds through the pastor in a healthy church setting that's what happens the pastor is doing god's work god's bidding god's word uh not his opinions god's word well, what happens if the pastor or the, the person in charge of the people aren't, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well, the, the, the people aren't going to be fed. It's like clogging up a drain. You know, it won't flow. It's, it's not going to get through. So that's what's been happening here. You had bad pastors, really bad pastors. <clears throat> so God is going to be the shepherd. Now, as he says here, verse 16, I will seek the lost, bring back the strayed, bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them justice. So he says, I will seek the lost. Hang on a second. So God says he's going to seek the lost. Bring back the strayed. Uh, bind up the injured. And strengthen the weak. All right, so God says, I'm going to seek the lost. I'm going to return the strayed. Uh, those who have strayed, I'm going to bring them back. If you're injured, I'm going to bind you up. If you're weak, I'm going to give you strength. Okay, that is a nice, succinct uh, list, not only outlining what God's will for his people is, but it also outlines the work of the church. It also, Lori says it sounds like a preschool. Well, on a field trip, preschool teacher on a field, well, right. Herding cats. I mean, that's how we are when compared to God. We're really that bad. Um, this is what the church does. The church seeks the lost. Okay, if, if, uh, if you have a church... It is their calling from God to bring the good news of Jesus to those who do not yet know. If you don't want to do that, then you're wanting to do church on your terms, not God's. Return the strayed. We all know people who were strong in the faith, went to church all the time, and then the next thing you know is you haven't seen them in a while. Something happened. They get distracted. They had some sort of problem, some sort of trial, and it got really bad, or some good things happened, and they got distracted that way, or their time, you know, uh, ability or constraints really got to them. And so they strayed away from church. And you know the danger of straying away from church. We've talked about that a bunch. God doesn't want you to be in the business of, well, they're gone, who cares, we've got other things going on. God wants you to go get them. God wants us as a church to go get them. That's what we do. Um, so care for those who have, 
And, and so, by the, by the way, if you're watching this, and by chance, well, I used to go to church a lot, but, you know, not so much anymore because of whatever reason. Um, the beautiful thing about Christianity is Sunday's a new day. Um, you can start all over next, next Sunday. It's a new day. So, come back to church. God wants you here. Bind up the injured. Help the hurting. Help the poor. Help those who are afraid. Help those who need help. You know, the imagery there would be the whole uh, Good Samaritan type of um, example. If someone is in need of help, the church should help them. And then, you know, strengthen the weak. The church is always about building up, not tearing down. Always about building up and not tearing down. So this is the work of the church. Evangelize the unbeliever, pursue lapsed Christians in love, help those who are hurting or in need, and make people into even better, stronger human beings. All of this done through the power of Christ. Okay. And again, this is what the Holy Spirit is going to do. If the Holy Spirit is driving your spiritual car, this is what you are going to want to do. If the... Um, Holy Spirit is not driving the car. Well, you know, it's going to be all about me. All right. Oh, and then he finishes the fat and the strong I will destroy. How does it say it? The fat and the strong I will destroy and I will feed them in justice. So the fat and the strong here... God isn't talking about the fat in this kind of fat. He's talking about those who uh, are in self-sufficiency mode or who don't see the need of God. Because if you, um, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're good, you don't need God, you can handle life on your own, including dealing with your sin, well... They're going to get justice, and the justice is going to end up being the exact opposite. God has just outlined all of the love that being in his presence brings. But if you don't need him, and you'd rather go about it on your own, in your own terms, well, you're going to be away from his presence. And what we're going to see here in a little bit shows you uh, what being away from his presence is like. All right, so that's that first section of Ezekiel 34. Then we're next going to do Ezekiel 20 through 24. I'm going to hold my breath now every time I put up graphics because of my woeful ineptitude. So let's see how this goes. Hopefully this is Ezekiel 34, 20 through 24. And it is not. I got him confused. All right, I see what I did. Uh, fortunately, Sam showed me how to fix such a snafu. I got them backwards. Actually, if I'd have known that, I could very simply have just... All right. Ezekiel 34, verses 20 through 24. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. So, if you take a good look at what is happening here, we are starting to, uh, you know what, watch this. Yeah, okay. Um, you're starting to see a dichotomy here. There's a, set, there's a, a, a definite distinction here between the people, the weak, and uh, the cast aside, the sheep that God was going out to get, versus those who were uh, not in need of God. You saw a difference. 
And so the end time, this, 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 now we coexist in our life right now, but when the end times comes, there'll be a difference, and um, there'll be a separation. We see the results of the separation when we study Matthew 25. All right, so verses 20 through 24. He says, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. The fat and the lean sheep. All right, now interesting is that they're both sheep. Now again, fat is referring to proud, self-righteous, lean, weak, oppressed, in need of mercy. But they're both sheep. But there's a distinction. Remember last week in the, in the, uh, the gospel lesson of Matthew when you had the, the, the three servants, the two, they all got talents, two of them just absolutely killed it, and the third one um, buried it because he didn't want to be bothered and take the time. Well, here you have, you know, the judging. And again, what makes them fat versus lean? What makes them in good standing versus lack of standing? Well, what it is is uh, repentance and faith. It always comes back to that. Now, when he talks about uh, pushing with your side, your shoulder, so you've seen like somebody really getting into and pushing something with all of their body weight um, or thrusting as a bull does with their horns, um, strong, domineering, the weak, in other words, um, that is how God is describing the oppression that the leaders are inflicting on the sheep in their care because of their lack of spiritual care. All right. Then he says, you've done this and you've scattered them abroad. Um, their lack of spiritual care has left all of the people in disarray. <clears throat> in disarray. And then he says, I will judge between sheep and sheep. That's verse 22. Judge between sheep and sheep. That is, God is going to judge. Remember, uh, I, I, they get, I get them confused. I don't know if it was last week or the week before. We talked about just going through the motions. Uh, during worship, during faith, during Christianity, if you're just kind of along for the ride without any sense of urgency, just uh, in an apathetic malaise, um, that's not true faith. Because true faith is going to inspire some semblance of uh, passion and love. So... When he judges for sheep as sheep, he's going to judge between genuine believers or the ones who are just kind of not believing at all, just kind of going through the motion. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Verse 23, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he, and he will feed them. So he's going to set up his servant David. Well, wait a second. King David, uh, we've already seen King David. Is King David somehow going to arise from the dead and take care of these people? Well, no, this isn't a reference of a risen King David, but rather the shepherd that will be the servant that God will set up over the people will be Jesus. That is a direct reference to Jesus, the good shepherd from John chapter 10 that you might recall. Um, and now it had been promised all throughout the Old Testament 
that, uh, you know, generation after generation after generation, starting with Adam and Eve all the way to the birth of Jesus, uh, you know, a descendant was going to come who would be the Messiah. And Jesus was always supposed to be uh, the Messiah, whoever it would be, would end up being a descendant of King David. And biologically speaking, Jesus was, in fact, a descendant of King David. <clears throat> and he says that this servant David um, shall feed them. So he says that David shall feed them. That is to say that all spiritual nourishment, past, present, future, comes through Jesus. All right. <clears throat> okay, very good. Uh, you guys have gotten quiet on me. Am I? Is my audio at work, or are you guys just kind of bored to tears with all of this stuff? I don't know. Okay, so let's move on to our gospel lesson. Matthew 25. And again, two parts, 31 through 40. Matthew 31 through 40. Now, if you were want to throw down two bits on a bet, I have a feeling that if I screwed up the text again on this next graphics change would be a pretty good bet down in Vegas. So let's see if Matthew 25 verses 31 through 40 is what we have next. Or 31 through 40. How about that? I got it right. All right. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, Jesus says, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you by the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these my brothers, you did to me. Well, I got it half right, didn't I? I tell you what, I need work. This actually is pretty shameful. There we go. At least I know how to recover a fumble. We've learned that today. <clears throat> okay. So you've heard that many, many times. So when the Son of Man comes in His glory... When the Son of Man comes in His glory. Oh, thanks, guys. Glad you're there. Okay. This is the third text in a row from Matthew that we've looked at, the third week in a row that we've looked at somebody or looked at the discussion of final judgment at the return of Jesus. But this is what we're talking about. The end times. Last day of the year, time to talk about the end times. <clears throat> now, he says, uh, when he's on his glorious throne, before him will be gathered all the nations when Jesus comes. All nations. That is to say that Jesus is the ruler over all. Everyone is subject to him. 
So there's no one, uh, you don't get the choice of whether or not you want to be subject to Jesus. Jesus is ruler of all nations. He is also redeemer of all nations, <clears throat> forgiver of all nations, merciful savior of all nations. But for anyone uh, who rejects Jesus in lieu of their own self-sufficiency, he is the judge of all nations. Now he says, Before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So here we talk about the separation. You saw two different folks in the Ezekiel text, and you're seeing two, it's, it's more overt here. There's uh, the sheep, which was in a good connotation in Ezekiel on the right, and the um, <clears throat> goats, which it's not going to end up well in this parable, as you will see on the left. So there's going to be this separation. There's going to be two different verdicts issued. And there's going to be uh, two different fates bestowed upon the people depending on the verdict. So you got innocent or guilty. Pretty simple. Now all of us by nature are guilty. But... Uh, the issue is not the guilt of your sin. The issue is the forgiveness of your sin that is available to you in Jesus. Uh, Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross brought about the forgiveness from everyone, for everyone. And that forgiveness, though, needs to be received, and it is received by Holy Spirit-driven repentance and faith. The blood of the Lamb will turn us into sheep before God. Exactly, Jeff. We are all by nature the goats. But the blood of lamb converts us into sheep. You know what? I keep stepping out of the picture here, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to widen this just a little bit. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> okay. So we said sheep on the right, goats on the left. Now, like we said, the sheep... Um, represents forgiven believers. The goats represent unbelievers. Now in this day, um, being on the right hand of someone or at the right hand of someone was considered to be a place of privilege. So the believers, the goats, being at the right hand of God, uh, that's where his power is, that's where his mercy is, and that is a place of privilege. Now he says... To those on his right, where's the exact words? Verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom of heaven, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the ones on the right, the ones on the right, are declared forgiven and going to heaven. All right, now understand something. They are declared heirs of heaven before we start talking about the deeds. Uh, hungry, uh, you know, fed me, thirsty, gave me drink. Before we talk about the deeds, the declaration is made. Why is that important? It's important because they are not going to heaven because of their deeds. They're going to heaven because of their forgiveness of sins received through repentance and faith. The deeds have nothing to do with their justification. The deeds are a result of sanctification. Those are fancy seminary terms. If um, you don't know what justification and sanctification is, message me, we'll talk. All right, um... Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> uh, 
man's salvation, man being in heaven, was part of God's design from the very beginning. That's the way God wants it. That's the way God's always wanted it. In fact, he wants it so badly that when sin came and corrupted that image and design, he came with the counter plan of Jesus to make sure that it would still come to pass because that's how he wants it. <clears throat> Lord, it reminds me of Hebrews 13, 2, when the scriptures talk about hospitality to strangers. We may be into entertaining angels unaware, but this goes beyond the command to love your neighbor. It's not about what we do. It's really a first commandment issue. God must come first. Our eternity depends on it. Yes, and see, that that's the thing. Um, when God is first, all of this other stuff is going to flow naturally because when God is first, Holy Spirit's driving the car. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. We want to love our neighbor. We want to serve each other. Um, <clears throat> every time I've taught the first commandment, be it to our confirmands or be it to the uh, adult um, joiners of the church lately, um, when God is number one, you're in a good place spiritually and good things are going to happen. Now, God isn't put number one by you. God is put number one by the Holy Spirit. Um, now, the devil is always trying to get you back. God saved you from him. He took you away from him, and he's not happy. Now, the devil doesn't have the power to reach into God's hand and snatch you away, but what he does have the power to do is to try by deception... Um, through instilling apathy or anger or fear or distraction or whatever to make anything else be most important in your life than God. If the devil is successful in putting anything else in the number one slot, you are in a bad place spiritually and you are going to experience spiritual decay and erosion. Until through repentance, boom, God's put back in the number one slot and now God starts to heal. But when Jesus is number number one on the list, number one uncontested on the list, you're in a good place spiritually, you're healthy, God's healing you, God's strengthening you. When Jesus gets pulled out of number one and literally anything else, whatever it is, gets put into number one, the devil is going to start inflicting damage on your faith. So it is, it's always the first commandment issue to be honest. All right, but prepare for you from, this is how it was supposed to be from the beginning. You in heaven. That's how it was designed. Then we start seeing, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. So I'm going to just summarize all of those as good works. Like I just said, as a result of your salvation, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and us to love each other. The Holy Spirit's going to lead us to love each other. Well, love always leads to works. Okay? Love doesn't love isn't stagnant. If you love somebody, if you're passionate about somebody, you're going to want to do things to make them happy because that's how love works. If you don't love them, then you're not going to care. So love is going to lead you. When we love each other, it's going to lead us to provide for the poor, welcome outsiders, care for the sick, visit the lonely, etc., etc. It is all motivated by love, and of course love comes from God. Then the righteous will answer, when did we do that stuff? Well, first off, the righteous answers. The sheep, the people on the right-hand side. <clears throat> they're righteous, like we said, you can't emphasize the point. They're righteous because their sins are forgiven, not because they did these things. Those things, doing these acts of love, feeding the hungry, etc., are not what made them righteous. Rather, 
They did those things because they were made righteous already by Jesus. Uh, what was the line that I had written? Good works are the result of our salvation, not the cause of it. Good works are the result of our salvation, not the cause of our salvation. I'd like to take credit for that line, but I can't. Uh, I read it and it was really good, so I wrote it down. So the righteous is going to answer, Lord, when did we do all these things? What are you talking about? No idea. When the Holy Spirit is driving the car, we're going to naturally do good deeds of service without realizing it. It becomes who we are. Do you think about the fact that you take a breath every few seconds? No, it just happens because it's who you are. You know, it, there, there are things as you go through life that you do that it's just so routine, it's habit, you don't even think twice about them. It's just what you do. Well, good works, loving your neighbor and serving your neighbor, it's going to be that way. It's going to be part of your Holy Spirit given nature because that's what the Holy Spirit does. So they, didn't, they were doing it out realizing this is just what we do. We didn't know we were doing this great thing. It's just what we do because that's what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. It just comes naturally when the Holy Spirit is in control. And Jesus, when they ask, when we do this, he says, as you did to the least of my brothers, then you did it to me. What you did to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So Jesus serves others through us, and we serve Jesus as we serve each other. That's a mouthful. Listen again. Jesus serves others through us, and we serve Jesus by serving each other. A major characteristic of Christianity is to help somebody who is in need. And God gives us His love, so that is what we want to do. That's what comes natural. That we, It happens reflexively when the Holy Spirit is driving the car. All right, now the last section, because we are up against it. Uh, 41 through 46. Let's hope I got one right today. I wouldn't bet on it. Let's see. All right. Matthew 25, 41 or through 46. Then Jesus says, Then they will say, He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or as a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. All right, I finally got one right on the graphics. Okay. Um, that's a little harsh to think of, but Jesus said it, so we need to wrestle with it and break it down. All right, how are things going here on the comments? All right. So first, the thing is he says, the first thing he says to him, depart from me. The ultimate finality of final judgment and the worst part of final judgment is the eternal separation of, from God. Depart from me. What makes it so bad is God's not going to be there. So if God's not going to be there, there's not going to be any love. There's not going to be any caring. You're not going to be provided for. You're not going to receive all the care and the love that he was giving his sheep. 
He's not going to be there. Now remember, the only reason he will be, you will be departing from him, or one would be departing from him in this situation, is because one chose to reject his offer of grace. It's not the way he wants it, but that's how it will be if one rejects Jesus. Okay, so, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire. All right, of course, clearly, this is condemnation to hell. You usually don't get a whole lot of hell until the end times, November. They're not pleasant, but it is helpful to hear once in a while because it is reality. Now, this is very interesting. Into the eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not designed for man. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, not you, not me, not humankind. Hell was not designed for man. According to God's original design and will, hell would, no humans would be there. Some will go, but they only go for rejecting the forgiveness of sins. Again, Sin cannot coexist with evil. Or with, excuse me, sin cannot coexist with holiness. There's a big barrier here. Sin cannot coexist with holiness. It, it's not possible. So that's why there is no sin in heaven... That's what makes heaven so great. There's no sin there. Well, of course, the problem is all of us are sinful. This is why Jesus had to get involved. Um, hell was not designed for humans. But at the same time, sin cannot coexist with holiness. So sin is what put hell on the table. All right. So then he says, uh, Hungry gave me no food. I was thirsty, you didn't give me no drink, and so forth and so on. So we'll say no good works. The Holy Spirit leads us to love each other. The sinful nature leads us to love self. Me, myself, and I. The sinful human nature leads one to look inwardly, and when we're looking inwardly, we're going to ignore the needs of others. Therefore, we're ignoring the will and service of God as we do it. <clears throat> Selfishness is a byproduct of a lack of love. No love leads to selfishness. If there's, you know, any type of relational dynamic and you don't love the person or the people that you're involved with, then it's going to be all about you. That's just how it works. Jeff, they did not do those, these things because their faith was dead. Precisely. Faith leads to love. Uh, faith leads you to want to do this. A lack of faith, the exact opposite is true. You don't want to do it. You don't care. So then they ask the question, Lord, when did we not serve you? When did we not do these things? What are you talking about? We have no idea what you're speaking of. So just as the Spirit naturally leads one to love and serve their neighbor, the flesh is naturally going to focus on one's self. And so Jesus responds, As you did not do to the least of these brothers, you did not do to me. In other words, uh, all the stuff you didn't do to help the people you could have, then you were not helping me. 
Now, think about this. Jesus' presence among us is to the extent He's so intertwined with His people that the way that we treat others is the way we treat Him. Because He's part of us all. How we treat someone else is how we treat Jesus. And so it says, uh, verse 46, These will go away into eternal punishment. Now, this love that the Holy Spirit gives us means we love all people. And all people means all people. Even the ones we may not like, okay, you you may not like them. Sin's always in the mix, but Holy Spirit's going to mean that you love them. At least respect them as a human being and such. Um... The reason why this phrase into eternal punishment struck a chord with me is there is a uh, a train of thought that says that uh, you know once you're once you're dead uh, and you're not going to heaven you're just kind of dead you're just poof you're just nothing you're just eternally asleep but this says no you're going to actually be punished continually. The dead apart from Christ do not simply cease to exist, but they will actually suffer eternally. As a Christian, the, the very thought of that ought to hurt your heart. There will be no end to the suffering in hell for all eternity. It's a horrible thought. So horrible a thought... In fact, that it ought to leave us Christians to do everything we have in our power and to pray for the power of God to witness, love, care, and serve the world to the extent that no one would ever have to meet that fate. You should not want any to see anyone have to deal with that. It says, they will go to eternal punishment, the ones on the left, but the sheep will, the righteous will go into eternal life. And again, the whole point here is the right, they are righteous because Jesus made them that way, not because they were that way, not because they earned righteousness, but because Jesus made them so, and they did not reject Jesus. So they are made worthy of eternal life in heaven. All right, so here again, putting this all together, At the end times, there'll be a separation. Righteousness from the wicked, and they have two completely different fates. So our text shows us, both of our texts show us a separation. In Ezekiel 34, the strong and the self-sufficient will be separated from the weak. And in Matthew 25, those who love and serve others will be separated from the self-centered and selfish. And the weak and those who love service are forgiven and cared for by God, not because of their service, but because God forgave them so they do the service. And others will be separated from God. But you, you are a baptized believer of Jesus. You have God's forgiveness and you have the Holy Spirit. So God cares for you. You're his sheep that he cares for. And he loves you. And you now have the desire to love and serve others. So because of Jesus, eternal life in heaven is your destiny. Thanks be to God. All right, everyone, once again, uh, we thank you for joining us. A reminder, next week, uh, 6 p.m. Central Time, no adult Bible study next Wednesday only, but do join us at 7 p.m. Central Time next week where you will watch the live stream of our Thanksgiving Eve worship service. So I thank you very much for joining us. I pray God's richest blessings in Christ Jesus upon all of you, and I wish you a very blessed weekend. May the Lord richly bless your day.